Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church Bible Study. Good to have you here with us this morning. We're in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 7. And uh, if, you all, if you ever wonder what we do before we start the class, you've got to show up here. It's private information. All right. But in chapter 2, we talked a little bit about uh, the recipients of grace. We'll get into that in a minute. And we're going to get today about the beneficiaries of grace. You know what a beneficiary is? That's somebody that's left in the will of somebody that's died, right? Well, guess what? Jesus died, rose again, and He left us the ability to have grace that He purchased in His. He bought a treasure and He gave it for us. In the field, we're the treasure. In our lives, the grace of God is one of the treasures we get. They have examples of grace. You're supposed to be an example of grace. What's grace look like? Uh, anybody here? It doesn't be like trying to decide what faith looks like. Jackson, your turn. <laughs> See? All right. Yeah, that's a, all right. Most of the people that if you ask the average high school boy what if he knew what grace and mercy and faith was would be, goes, oh yeah, they're in my science class. You know what I mean? There, there's some girl. But and in the world we live in, you don't hear much about that. When's the last time you talk, you heard any politician talking about the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the truth of God? You know, very rare, isn't it? Examples of grace. And then we're supposed to be ambassadors of grace. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go through it today. We get started with it. Uh, if you got your Bible there, let's start reading together. Verse In Acts 15, 11, I, you don't have to turn there, but... But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Grace is grace. If you add anything to it, it's not grace. Take anything away from it, it's not grace. If you're going to work at it, it's not grace. It's a gift, unearned, undeserved, that God gives you. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, you know how I'm getting to heaven? By the grace of God. And Paul would tell you that. He said, you know, I'm the least of all the apostles. And he said, I don't even deserve to be apostles, but I want you to know I've worked harder than all the rest of them. Not because you have to. That grace in our life should motivate reaction toward God that we really don't have to do. Hmm? When, when, when you give a birthday present to one of your grandkids, you say, now here's all the rules that go along with that. No, no, you don't. It's theirs and they do with it. If they appreciate it, then they keep it, right? All right. And look, at, we'll, we'll go through it. Peter said in chapter 2, in verse 10, in time past, we were not a people. Now, it would do you well to read the book of Psalms because we're mentioned three times in the book of Psalms as people that are going to be people who are going to be named what we aren't named yet in the book of Psalms, but are now a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The difference between grace, that's unmerited favor. You're getting something you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something you deserve. And that's the judgment. It's, you get that? Grace is getting what you don't deserve and mercy is not getting what you deserve. And God did both of those things with us when we're saved. In the recipients of grace, 1 through 3 in chapter, it said, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation all of our life, our lifestyle, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we work in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and where of the mind, and where by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Nowhere in there is it said, you guys were good enough, you just walked in. We're as bad as everybody else. We were recipients of God's grace. Number two, in verse four through eight, it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for the great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sin, that's quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Isn't that cool? I like that. And then we're going to go on to 9 and 10, and we'll look at the, the examples of grace of God in our lifetime when He was saying, 
not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. Okay, we didn't work for it. But he created us for a reason. If God's only desire was to see you go to heaven, as soon as you got saved and sealed by the Spirit of God, He'd just take you home. Because as soon as you get there, you're going to be perfect. We see Him, we're going to be like He is. There won't be any flaws at all. But He didn't do it, did He? He left you here. Because the plan is that, and this is it, do you know that angels cannot preach the gospel? When the angel showed up to the centurion, he said, go get Peter. He'll tell you about it. Every time, it's one person telling another person. For God to reach us with the gospel, He had to become a man. He couldn't send an angel. He couldn't make some kind of edict. He's God. But He's not going to change His character. He's holy and righteous. But He's also loving and kind and truthful and graceful. Examples of grace, that's what we're supposed to be in verses 9 and 10 when He talks about, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. How many of y'all, I love tools. I love any kind of tools. I love tools. I remember being over at Charles Blankenship's house one time and he was all angry because he'd been out to the shipyards in San Diego and he saw a propeller wrench he didn't have a propeller wrench. And he was complaining because his wife wouldn't let him have a propeller wrench. Did anybody here ever seen a propeller wrench? Think about a hand tool that's in your box. It's about that long, the, your biggest one you got. Think about one that's as long as this room. The nuts on the propellers are not like little, they're just huge. Brother Bob's seen them in the shipyard. You're in the Navy. You, I don't, did you ever see a propeller nut when you're in the Navy? No. You just saw the regular nuts on the boat, didn't you? Right. All right. You know, all those cool things you ever seen. It's, a, it's amazing how big that stuff is. He, he just wanted one. My wife has never let me have a tank. I can see that in my yard. Just, I don't really have to work. I just want it out there. You know what I mean? With the tarrant to work. But uh, anyhow. Uh, but we, it, it's not what we wanted. God made us for it. It has to be usable or it's worthless. Do, do you understand that? If you're going to have a propeller wrench, then you need somewhere to tighten up a propeller with it. If God gives you one, you're in the boat business, I guarantee you, somewhere down the way. Something's going to happen with you. And the same thing with everything else. Well, He gave you this. He said, we're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, Unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And you can go back to the book of Romans chapter 8 and read verse 1. You understand when he said that, that before we were ever saved, God had already had the plan that when we were, we would grow to be like His Son. The longer you're here, you ought to be more like Jesus. And then the last one of these things we'll get into is we're ambassadors of the grace of God in the world. Uh, I don't Have you ever... Can you imagine an ambassador for the United States going to another country and all they do is tell about how awful America is? Boy, I wished I lived in this communist country. I wished I lived in this country where they had no privileges. I like that. No. An ambassador is supposed to represent all that is of us here. What, what is it? Is America perfect? Nope. But we haven't had any problem getting people to come here. And we don't put up fences to keep them in. All right? There's a reason for that. Now here's the whole deal. An ambassador goes to represent the, the, the country they're from with the best. To show the best of it. If we're ambassadors of grace to the world, then we ought to demonstrate the greatest part of grace. You say, well, I thought you were a Christian. Why are you drinking a beer? I'm saved by grace. I can still do anything I want. See, that's not the greater part of grace. The same grace that saved you is supposed to change you. If any man be in Christ, he is a same old crud. No, no, it doesn't. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Creature. A new creation. Okay? So let's look at that as we go through it. 
We'll get into that first. First, number one, you got the narrow gate of sanctification is the appreciation of grace. Without grace, you would be lost. Now think again, when I say the words like, we are now in the age of grace. Has God not ever been graceful? No. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Job found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But it was not the age of grace. We live in the age of grace where the grace of God makes it possible for any man anywhere to come to know our Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. We got a guy in our church that was from a foreign country, didn't speak English. A guy walked up to him, stuck a Bible in his face and told him to go home and read it. He did. Read in the Scripture. Never heard anything about Jesus before in his whole lifetime. Then and there that God said that He would save him by grace if He asked him and He asked him to. And God saved him. You say, well, how's that work? That's why it's called grace. Unto you there which believe, He is precious. How many of y'all own anything precious? You don't own her, son. Okay. All right. All right. She's still rented. So here, all of you guys that are married, you understand? You're still going to pay till the day you die. All right. It's renting. It's a good payment, though. We love that, right? Unto you therefore which believe, He is precious. You have anything that's precious? I'm, I'm serious. Yeah. We lost our house in a flood. We lost our, most of our house one time in a fire. We, you know, we've lost our house. Oh, you just start over again. I learned a lot of things uh, about people who go through floods because my house went through a flood. When we were working with Harvey and we were in charge of a lot of shipping things to South Texas and uh, for a whole bunch of reasons God put in order. I didn't do it. God did. But uh, they called and said, you know, what is it? You know, we, what can we do to, for South Texas? I said, well, well they, they need a couple of things. They need food. They got more water than they know what to do with. So they have hundreds of truckloads of water because that's easy. Grateful for the times. But they needed food and they needed hot food. People to make sure the ones that are working there. So the Baptist men got in on that and we put all kinds of stuff together. And they said, you know, what can we do for them as far as possessions? Guess what I knew? You say, well, I'm buying them a new washing machine. They don't have any house to put it in or electricity to plug it in or a place to store it. But I'll tell you what they do need, a mattress. Just a mattress to sleep on. All those people in those shelters, you ever slept on a shelter hard floor for a couple of weeks? Cheryl and I, one time, we were traveling with the children's home and the bus broke down. We stayed in the church basement. And so, you get tired of that floor thing pretty quick. You said, well, I had two blankets under me. I never did like two blankets. On, and I slept on the ground lots of my life. But I want you to understand, uh, that gets pretty hard. They need a mattress. They need a place to lay down. So the, I can say this because they did. The Sealy Mattress Company in Texas donated like truck, semi-truck loads of mattresses to take down there. Just the mattress. Not the, they didn't need the box springs and the beds. They didn't have a place to put that. They need something you can throw on the ground, lay on at nighttime, go to sleep. All right. God knows what I need. Does, does that, I mean, what I really need. You, you understand that? And He knew I needed a way of salvation. And there's not hundreds of ways. Jesus said, I am the way. Paul, as Peter would say, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Paul would say, those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? And so it's a narrow gate. That's what Jesus said. In Matthew, He said, if you then being evil know how to get good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven good good things to them that ask Him? Now, this weekend, my teens are going to be here and we're going to, we're going to have some games to play. Okay? And, and the preacher's still part kid. 
Okay, so they wanted to do Nerf gun shooting. You know, where they get those little Nerf bullets, you know, the little foam things and shoot them at each other. And I never had a Nerf gun, so I ordered one. It shoots 100 rounds a minute. <laughs> Tell them what Kylie said when she first, I saw it, we, they come in, they stick on the wall, you know, like on stuff. She said what? We're dead. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. <laughs> yes. all right. That's a cool deal. All right. So we, we're, we're into that. But if I was starving and you brought me a Nerf gun, I would go, thank you. I think. I can't even kill anything with that. You know what I mean? They're, they're made not to hurt you. They're foam rubber. We needed one thing. We were going to hell. Every last one of us. We're all sinners. There's none righteous. We needed something that would fit every one of us. The really, really good people, and there are really good people in the world. And the really, really bad people. And there's some of those people in the world. And everybody in between. And Jesus said this, all things that you would have been due to you even though for them. And he said this, how many of you know if your kids ask for something, would you give it to them? If they ask you for a fish, would you give them a stone? If they ask you for bread, would you give them a serpent? God knows what you need. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, there's only one of those things. He's doing the preaching here, guys, not me. Okay, and he said that enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be that go therein, but cause straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. All right. If you know Christ as Savior, think about all the people in the world. I would say 90% of the people in the world never here. That, that's amazing. You talk about the hundreds that are saved in China. They have billions of people there. How many? I, maybe I'm off on that. Maybe it's only 87%. But I'm telling you, if I go to the doctor and he goes, well, you got a 50% chance of coming through this. I don't go, Whoa! 50%. No, sir, I'm calling the preacher. Oh, yeah, I am the preacher. And I want to say, pray for me because I only got a 50% chance of making it. We don't like those odds, do we? I don't like it when he goes, there's a 98% chance you're going to be cured. I'm worried about the 2%. Narrow is the way. All right. Unto you that which believe, he's precious. You know why he's precious? He's the only one. He is the only one. How many of y'all ever heard of a lady named Queen Elizabeth? How many of you were around before she was queen and she got married to her husband and stayed married all those years with him? All right. How many of you watched their wedding? You didn't? She was a long ruling. You'd have to be old enough to be older than me. Well, guess what? A piece of the everybody that went to her wedding got a piece of cake already cut and sliced in a deal to cake at their wedding. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people around the world went. There are two pieces of it still left in the world. One piece that sold on auction last week for more than a million dollars. A little bitty tiny slice of cake. Sad. I wouldn't give it for that. It's because you're thinking about eating it. All right. But you know what? If they said, you know, the preacher don't eat cake, you know that? Doesn't have any part of that, can't stand it, do it. But if you said, hey, you want a piece of the cake that was cut off of Queen Elizabeth's before she was queen cake to have? I'd say, 
Yes! Precious means rare. If we ever find the ability that diamonds just start popping up from the... Your diamonds will be worthless. Same thing with gold or everything else. The reason it's precious is because it's rare. He's precious because this is really rare. That the creator of the universe was thinking about you. Which believe he is precious unto them which is disobedient. He's not. Now listen, we talked about last week about the stone and the way that stone is, works into what Pod's, Paul said about him being the foundation. He is the foundation stone, just like that great big one they put down and, and Solomon built the temple. He's the foundation stone. And Paul, Jesus quoted the verse out of the book of Psalms over and over when He said, this is the stone which the builders rejected, which has now become the head of the corner. Paul said that stone was the foundation stone there's no other foundation to can many man lay that is laid except the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he said, your life as a Christian is to build on that stone. What are you building on the foundation? That's where we stopped last week. To the others, guys, he's made a stone of stumbling. Well, if that's true, what you're saying, then I don't get to go the way I want. You know what I don't like about people? They're always trying to get me to do the right thing. You say, well, not really. People wouldn't do that, would they? No. <clears throat> How many drug addicts would jump at the chance to get cleaned up? How many alcoholics would give it up if they just had an opportunity? They won't. A lot of people would just keep choosing it. Choosing it over life. I don't want their life. I like the one God gave me. But to them, the same Christ that I receive and I'm just overjoyed with is a stone of stumbling. What do you do with a stone of stumbling? you got a rock in your walkway and it sticks up and you keep tripping over it. What do you do? Come on, tell me. You get rid of it. In our country, what are we doing with the stone of stumbling? We're getting rid of him. He's out of our courthouses. He's out of our schools. He's out of our public arenas. He's out of He's totally out of politics. You know what I mean? Gosh, this person here believes in Jesus. What a weirdo. A stone of stumbling. A rock of offense. See, I'm way better off than you guys were. And still are. You say, how do you know? When the preacher said, you are a sinner. I didn't say, no I'm not. I said, he knows me. Who told him about me? I like it. You say, how do you know? How do you like it? Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. As soon as He quoted that verse, I said, I'm in. If He came after righteous people, I'm sunk. But if He came after sinners, I'm in. They stumble at the Word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, I want you to understand God didn't designate anybody to hell or anybody to heaven. You choose. He gives you the opportunity. But I want you to understand what you choose brings you an expected outcome. You refuse the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Your place is already appointed. It's ended. God didn't pick out a couple of people He liked and some others He didn't like. He said he'd have all men everywhere. And I know, I, I, I talk to the people too. They go, well, that God meant that He was going to save a few people out of every people group. They're the ones that are already picked out. I have an answer for that, and it's not theological. It's, okay? That's not true. God loves all men everywhere. For God so loved the world 
You can't show me anywhere that he hated anybody. The Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, when he knew what Judas was going to do, and he knew it all of his life, he could have had him killed 4,000 times. He's God. Go back and find the first place he said, for he knew who should betray him. For he knew who was going to betray him. He knew what he did. Who's the one at the, at the table that said, what are you going to do? Go do it quickly. When he came up to him to kiss him, he knew what he was going to do. The psalmist had already written. He said, but twist thou me with a kiss. And he said, friend. Friend. Your attitude changed. Mine did not. You're talking about a friend of men. That's who he is. You reject that. Don't get angry with God because your life is turned into hell. Well, my life is miserable. I got an idea. Get right with God. You say, when I get right with God, will everything in my life go good? According to God, it will. But I haven't liked everything He gave me to handle. He taught me something really hard, guys. I want you to understand. Nothing in the whole world is mine. I just get to borrow it for a while. I guess to be a part of it at a while. If you got about an hour, I'll tell you at one thing right after another that he proved to me that was his and not mine. Some of the greatest things you can do on the face of the earth, they were still God's. He does with them as he would. Why couldn't he do that with me? If you move forward with this, I didn't get very far, did I? All right. Sanctification is what we're going to deal with next. And what that means, it's being set apart. And we're going to show you something that nobody has just set apart and left. How many of you have ever heard of that graveyard where they have all those airplanes out in the desert? And, you know, I want to go out there and just spend like a week just going in and out of all the different airplanes sitting in the control boxes, <laughs> you know, just doing, just seeing the, the planes and trains and what. Yeah, you can go with me when I go. Okay. Right. We'll just crawl over all those airplanes and stuff because they fascinate me. I like ships and planes and things like that. Don't ever even plan to try to fly one off or anything or take it apart. I just like to see them. I, I like to see things, how it is tremendous sometimes the engineering in some of that stuff. To know men and women put their lives on at stake flying some of those things all over the world. I like that. To be able to... Yeah, okay, I don't want to live there though. About lunch, I'll be ready to go somewhere and come back. All right, but our sanctification is this, guys, listen to me. I enjoy everything I have in my You see, everything perfect in your world? Oh, yeah. That's a lie. No, it's not. Have you not seen me limp out later, lately? <coughs> I had a guy come about a year ago who said, you know, you, you kind of swagger like John Wayne. I said, it's called a limp. It's not a swagger. That's just the way I, that's what happens when I walk. I fall over to the side. I don't know. That's a limp. All right. Everything that's happened in my life, but you know what? And everything is done. You look back, was God not in it? Was God not able to use what He did with you? Did He not teach you something? Didn't you come out of it closer to Him? Ask Job. How'd you like what you was going through, Job, when you was going through it? He said, I don't like it. So would you rather not? No, you know what? He found out things about God he'd have never known any other way. We'll talk about that next week. Father in heaven, what a privilege to serve you and what a privilege, Lord, to know you as personal Savior. But what a responsibility as well. Lord, to take what you've given us, this wonderful gift, and use it in a way that it honors you. And Lord, we pray that's what our salvation might do not give us the freedom to live like the devil, but give us the ability to live like our Savior. 
And we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen.